Not too long ago, a group of theologians from many denominations got together for some good, healthy dialogue. Protestants, Catholics, Evangelicals, Charismatics. As the meeting got underway, the question naturally arose, well, what in the world can we all agree on? One person wisecracked, well, let's put down in our charter that we all believe in the writings of C.S. Lewis. But what if I admire the writings and the theology of C.S. Lewis so much that I begin devouring every single thing he wrote, every book, every manuscript, every letter, every book about him? Well, that might be all right as long as I still found time to eat and sleep and attend to the business of life. But what if I was so devotedly and devoutly an admirer of Clive Staples Lewis that I found myself becoming a disciple of the man. Whenever I read other Christian publications, if I ever did, would I compare them against the Lewis theology? Lewis would be my yardstick, my absolute standard. Any new ideas, if they didn't conform to the belief system that I had from C.S. Lewis, I'd toss out immediately. Can you begin to sense the danger? You can, can't you? But now let me take it just a step further. C.S. Lewis passed away on November 22, 1963, the same day as the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. But if he were living today and I were his man, his disciple, wouldn't I begin to blindly follow his every new teaching as well? If he said move, I'd pull up my roots and go. Should he tell me to sell my home? I put it on the market. Divorce my wife? Sure. Move to a commune with him just outside of Oxford? I'll be there tomorrow, Mr. Lewis. Have one of your disciples pick me up at Heathrow Airport. Writing to the fledgling Christian church in Corinth, Paul soberly warns them, apparently some of you are saying, I am committed to what Paul says. And others, I'm committed to what Apollos says. Still others say, I'm committed to what Peter says. And there are some who say, I'm committed to what Christ says. You can see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12. Let's observe again that such disciple thinking in which we follow a human being is what leads men and women to the poisonous grape Kool-Aid of Jonestown. First, a preacher says, move, and we do. Then that preacher commands what we read, and we read. Finally, he or she says, drink, and we die. Because we tend to follow human leaders everywhere they go. You may be thinking to yourself, well, that's kind of a stretch. I like my pastor. He's a person of God. When he preaches, I pay attention. Sure, I'm a follower. Where's the danger, Lonnie? We're not packing up for Rancho Santa Fe or Jonestown anytime soon. I remember with painful clarity something that happened in a congregation not too many years ago in Central California. A woman in her mid-40s taught a Sabbath school class every weekend in church. It seemed like a good class with serious Bible study and a faithful group coming each time. But she never had a substitute teacher and the woman never seemed to take a vacation. 52 weeks a year, she was there with the same people always in the class. She had a following. A bit by bit, the pastor began to notice that some of her teaching didn't actually come from God's word. She would try to interpret prophecy, and a number of her conclusions didn't match either the plain truths of the Bible or the interpretations that my Adventist denomination felt were biblically sound. He cautioned her, but the woman pressed on. Her class members resented the interference and weren't hesitant to let the pastor know their feelings. A bit more time went by and the group was clearly heading out into shark-infested waters. The woman's teaching was just plain wrong now. 
Also, a most unscriptural, unloving atmosphere had developed among the small group of one teacher and tight-knit bunch of followers who alone had the truth. Everyone else in the church, they thought, was close to Babylon, except for them. Well, finally, the pastor, after a long time of prayer, meditation, had to tell the woman, Mrs. X, you're going to have to leave. You cannot stay in this church and poison the minds of these people. Well, after some red-in-the-face protests, she did indeed depart with her whole class. Every single one of them were following her, they told the pastor, and we won't be back. For the next several years, the woman and her little group of disciples met alone at her home. The group dwindled as the poison of error ate at the core. A few finally rejoined the main church, thanks to some intense prayer on the part of relatives and friends. But I can tell you that it could easily have been another cult suicide moment on the evening news, because these were people who had decided to follow a person. Such experiences happen in every denomination. It's interesting to notice that Paul, the man doing the writing, includes himself as one of those being followed in the new church in Corinth. Some of you follow Paul, he exclaimed. Don't follow me. In the next verse he asks, was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? In fact, he goes on to say, I'm glad I hardly baptized any of you myself. I let your own local pastor do it. Apparently, as a wise Bible teacher, he understood how easily a new member, a baptismal candidate, can bond to the baptizer and begin following too blindly in the spiritual footsteps of that man or woman. I've known of a Christian softball team in which every summer some of the guys pop up on a new team. Hey, what are you doing over here? I thought you were with such and such a group. Sometimes it turns out they were just tired of losing so much. But you know, often the answer comes back, well, we like the pastor over here better. He's really great. They change both their baseball uniform and their religious loyalty because they admire a person. So what's the antidote to Jonestown? How do we resist the temptation to follow Jim Jones? I find the answer exactly 19 times right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 19 times in these 31 verses, Paul takes us back to the Lord Jesus Christ. A focus on Christ is our only protection from disaster. Not on Christ through the teachings of C.S. Lewis, or Marshall Herf Applewhite, or even your own wonderful pastor, but a focus right on Christ through the pages of Scripture, through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus as revealed in the Bible. Now, I do find much about Christ in a book like Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. I hear my own pastor, Dennis Smith, who pastors my church in Surprise, Arizona, preach a beautiful sermon about Jesus and I'm grateful. But I have to protect myself daily from the temptation to allow myself to be fed even good, wholesome Christianity through just one vessel, one man, one woman. We see this dangerous tendency all the time in the Christian faith and in virtually every denomination. Someone develops a bit of a name, let's say, because he or she has written four or five books more than just good Christian books, they actually express a new way of looking at our faith. They have a spin that's unique. No one has ever put things that way before. So quickly, a group of people forms who appreciate the new perspective. It's almost a new theology. I hear them say at church, oh, we're kind of into so-and-so. Have you read his latest? It's really something. In fact, we got some of his CDs last week. Let me lend them to you. The books and the CDs and magazine articles soon become an umbilical cord of dependence. The people have become devoted 
followers of a person. Let me encourage you and plead with you to seek the heart of Jesus through many avenues. Don't focus on a few. God will protect us from such a danger if we ask him to. Just a few verses earlier in the same chapter, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 8, Paul writes, He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into fellowship with his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful.